Hello, good evening everyone and welcome to the Eurogen webinar programme. Um, I just want to take a couple of minutes just before we get started to explain a little bit about what a European reference network is and does. So Eurogen is one of 24 European reference networks created and funded by the European Commission in 2017. And they're all networks of highly specialised healthcare providers that collaborate to help patients with rare and complex diseases. And in Eurogen, we deal with rare urogenital uh, diseases and complex conditions. And we're currently a network of 57 high hospitals across 20 member states. So our aim is to deliver quicker specialist evaluation and more equitable access to high quality diagnosis, treatment and care for patients with rare urogenital diseases and complex conditions. And they're all patients who need highly specialised surgery where the expertise is rare. So some of our activities include uh, the clinical patient management system, which is an IT platform provided by the European Commission. It's fully secure and it enables us to conduct virtual MDTs with our network of experts. So I would strongly encourage any of you out there who have a complex case and you would like advice, please contact us. It's completely free and we'd be delighted to provide it. We also collaborate on education and training activities, producing clinical guidelines, and uh, we also have a Eurogen patient registry, which is very exciting. Um, so all of our hospitals will be entering the data so that we can bring the data of uh, rare um, and complex diseases together over hopefully the next 25 years plus. And of course, that data will feed into the production of the clinical guidelines. So without further ado, uh, tonight's webinar is on um, partial adrenectomy. And I'm delighted to have uh, some experts from our network from Zagreb here with us tonight. Uh, so the first presenter is Karine Zibar Tomzik and her colleague Nicola uh, Knevig and uh, thank you so much for sharing your expertise here with us this evening so you'll have two presentations followed by the opportunity to ask questions so again thank you very much for joining us and I look forward to seeing the presentations good afternoon to everyone I'm uh, Karin Zibar Tomšić coming from Zagreb from Croatia I'm an endocrinologist and uh, I will present you here an endocrinologist overview about the primary uh, aldosteronism. So first, uh, what is primary aldosteronism? Uh, we have autonomously unsuppressible secretion of aldosterone, which is independently of the plasma renin activity. So first we have to the state of the extracellular volume expansion because of the high aldosterone concentration, which resulted in the decreased secretion of renin and decreased production of angiotensin II. And because of that, we have suppressed renin. The second, we have an inability to stimulate renin secretion on some physiological stimulants, as is the posture position, decreased salt intake or volume constriction. And the third, uh, what I already said at the beginning, we have inadequate adequately secretion of the aldosterone despite the volume expansion, despite the decreased angiotensin Q and the hypokalemia. Uh, what are the causes of the primary aldosteronism? There are a few possible causes, but the most common causes are aldosterone producing adenoma in a 30% of the patients, what we call APA. And the most common cause is a bilateral idiopathic hyperplasia, which is uh, in the 60% of the patients. All other causes are much rare. Uh, what about the PA prevalence? Uh, we can say that it is very different due to arbitrary cutoff values for aldosterone concentration or aldosterone to rain ratio, and uh, due to the different confirmatory tests that are uh, used in uh, clinics. So due to that, we have a different cut of values. So what is the problem? That only 8% of the patients with resistant arterial hypertension and hypokalemia undergo screening and less than 1% of all PI patients are discovered. 
according to the screening, what is the prevalence of P8? If you look in the patients with moderate and severe hypertension, independent on the stage of the arterial hypertension, but what we can see that the overall prevalence is 6.1 percentage if we screen patients with moderate and severe hypertension. The prevalence of PA in patients with resistant hypertension is in a, up to 24% of the patients. If we look at in the patients with hypokalemia, we can see that it is between the 30% up to 88% of the patients. If we screen the patients with adrenal incidentaloma for PA, uh, the median prevalence is about 2% of the patients, and if we screen the patients with hypertension and obstructive sleep apnea, the prevalence is up to 34%. So the question is to whom to perform PA screening. So uh, we have to perform in, it in patients with severe or resistant arterial hypertension, in patients with arterial hypertension plus adrenal incidentaloma or atrial fibrillation or obstructive sleep apnea, in patients with hypokalemia, that is independently of the blood pressure, and also in the patients with family history of on PA. Why do we treat all these patients? So it is known that untreated patients have higher risk for coronary disease, for cerebrovascular disease, for diabetes mellitus, and for chronic kidney failure. So regarding that, early diagnosis and specific treatment are necessary in reducing morbidity and mortality of those patients. Uh, how do we diagnose PA? So uh, I will go through the case. Uh, the, this is the 35-year-old female patient that presented with hypokalemia and arterial hypertension for seven years. She had one antihypertensive medication we did the screening for PA, which included uh, aldosterone concentration, which was very high, 2530 picomol per liter, suppressed plasma rain activity that was very low, 0 0.2 microgram per liter per hour, and very high aldosterone to rain ratio. We can see that she was under the potassium supplementation, but she still had hypokalemia of 2.7. So this was the screening test that was, was positive, the aldosterone concentration was more than 277 picomol per liter, so we can say that we have a suspicion or we have a primary aldo patient. The next um, uh, stage that what we do in, in the chronology, this is the confirmation test. Uh, in our clinical practice, in our clinic, we do aldosterone in a cell and suppression test. So we give the patients of two liter of saline during the four hours. And what we do, we measure aldosterone concentration four hours after uh, infusion. And we can see that the aldosterone concentration was unsuppressible. It was 1470 picomol per liter. And in healthy individuals, it should be less than uh, this number. So we can say that we confirm the primary aldosteronism in our patient. So how would we know if the patient has unilateral or bilateral disease? How we, would we determine the site of aldosterone secretion? So the procedure, what we do in our center, it is adrenal vein sampling. Uh, it is a procedure that is done by interventional radiologists uh, who cannulate first the right adrenal vein, then in very vena cava, after that the left adrenal vein, and after that left uh, in, uh, left, uh, on the left side, inferior vena cava, and we have some indices that we calculate. So the criteria that we use in our, at our institution using the ACTH stimulation, the first index that we have to calculate, this is the selectivity ratio. We have to know if the penulation was successful. So we uh, have to divide the cortisol from the each adrenal vein divided by that in inferior vena cava. If the ratio from the cortisol in each adrenal vein to that in, in inferior vena cava is more than five, then we can say that it was a successful cannulation. If we have successful cannulation of the both adrenal vein, then we can calculate the lateralization ratio. The lateralization ratio means that we have to divide aldosterone to cortisol concentration in each adrenal vein and after that, we have to divide the ratio from the dominant side divided by that in non-dominant side. And if that ratio is more than four, then we can know that we have patients with unilateral primary aldo. 
the lateralization index has enough sensitivity and specificity in differentiating unilateral from bilateral disease, and so far it is a gold standard for subtyping PA. If we look back to our patient, uh, we performed adrenal vein sampling, and if we, if we look on the results, we can see that the, the right adrenal vein was successfully cannulated, the ratio was more than five, the left adrenal vein was also successfully cannulated, the ratio was more than five, so now we could calculate lateralization ratio, and if we divide 2.9 on the right side, by 0.4 on the left side, then we can see that the lateralization ratio is 6.6, .6. it is more than 4, uh, the right side is dominant, so we can say that the patient has unilateral right disease. So it was a bilaterally successful AVS, with AVS which, is, which says to us that the patient has right unilateral disease. So what about the role of the abdominal CT in subtyping PA? So why do we perform the CT in those patients? First, we have to exclude adrenocortical carcinoma, which is very rare in primary ALDO. And the second, uh, we perform a CT also for the radiologist to see the anatomy of adrenal vein. So what did we see on this CT? that the patient, she had a right side adenoma of 18 millimeters, and we can say in our case that uh, CT match with ABS. It was right unilateral disease and right side sided adenoma. But what is the problem in a clinical practice that CT matches with ABS only in 50 percentage of the patients. So we have always to perform ABS to be sure if the patient have uh, has unilateral or bilateral disease. Uh, what about the treatment? So if you have patients uh, with bilateral disease, we can only give the medical therapy, mineral corticoid receptor antigenist therapy to our patients, and this is the lifelong therapy. But if you have patients with unilateral disease, then we can perform surgery. So there are no randomized controlled trials to date, but what did the cohort studies? They showed that adrenalectomy has advantage in comparison to mineral corticoid antigenist therapy, that it significantly reduced cardiovascular risk and gave a high quality of life. If you look here on this graph, the green line are the patients with primary ALDO treated with surgical adrenalectomy, and we can see here that they have much lower incidence of cardiovascular events in comparison with the patients who were on mineral corticoid antigenist therapy. So regarding our patients who was uh, young, uh, who had hyperkalemia, primary ALDO, uh, right-sided adenoma on CT and AVS, which suggests it's right unilateral disease, we decided to perform surgery. Later, uh, after my presentation, Dr. Knežević will uh, talk regarding the um, uh, choices and types of the surgery for the patients. Uh, so, something about the pathohistology classification. In 2022, WHO uh, they released the new Histaldo classification scheme for the primary ALDO patients. We have six groups of the patients. The first group with carcinoma is very rare, but the second uh, five groups, these are not so rare. So they said to us that they have like classic histology that includes patients with adenoma and aldosterone producing nodule. And it is good if we have this uh, pathohistology, but on the other side, if we have patients with aldosterone producing micronodule, multiple nodules, or, or aldosterone producing deficient hyperplasia, this is the problem because the biochemical disease recurrence, which occur in those patients, is 42 percentage. They can um, uh, they can have primary aldo also on the other adrenal gland. So only 5% of those patients with classic histology, with APA or aldosterone producing nodule, will uh, have biochemical disease recurrence in comparison with 42% of those patients with non-classic histology. So uh, our patient, uh, she had adenoma on pathohistological edemases, but I have to say that we do not still perform immunohistochemistry in Croatia. 
uh, and the post-operative one-year follow-up showed us that she was in a biochemical remission of disease. She has she had normal dosterone concentration in salivary suppression test. She had normal potassium level and unsuppressed plasma rain activity. And what else? She was without any antihypertensive therapy. So we can say that she was in a clinical and also by chemical remission of disease. And what are the conclusions? Uh, the primary ALDO is the most common cause of secondary arterial hypertension. So we have to think about the disease and we have to test more patients because most of them are underdiscovered. First, we have to look on the plasma rain activity, and if it is very low, very suppressed, then we have to analyze aldosterone value. Adrenal vein sampling is still the gold standard for the subtyping of PA, and surgery is a treatment of the choice in patients with unilateral PA, but lifelong mineral corticoid antagonist therapy in patients with bilateral PA. And now we have new pathohistology histalo classification, which is a good marker for prediction for biochemical. Uh, disease recurrence. That was our first presentation. Now we are moving on to our second presentation given by Nicola. My name is Nikola Knežević and I'm coming from Hospital Center Zagreb. And today I will present our experience with partial adrenalectomy. I have no conflict of interest. This is the agenda for today's presentation. Total adrenalectomy is standard operative treatment for adrenal tumors, especially laparoscopic approach, which is today considered golden standard for treatment of adrenal tumors. Best results are achieved in the high volume center under supervision of multidisciplinary team MDT. The concept of organ preserving surgery is widely accepted to preserve the function of affected organ even in malignant disease, like we see in breast cancer, kidney cancer. So why we not perform much more often with adrenal tumors, especially the majority of the adrenal tumors are benign. The aim of partial rectomy is to preserve endocrine function of the adrenal gland, which significantly affects quality of life. Nowadays, this approach is accepted in bilateral tumors, especially familial syndrome like men, or when it is solitary gland affected. Our proposal is to extend this indication to small unilateral tumors and even in small metastases. The aim of partial adrenectomy is preservation of hormonal function of adrenals. It is shown even with solitary adrenal gland, patients do not respond to stress in the same way as normal controls. <clears throat> also, it is important to think, especially in younger patients, after total adrenalectomy, during the lifespan, there are a lot of hazards for solitary adrenal gland. So, the aim of all this is to avoid the long term morbidity of steroid replacement therapy. So, as we said, today, indication for partial adrenalectomy are bilateral tumors, especially familiar syndromes like men, or tumors of solitary adrenal gland. Uh, the main contraindication for partial approach is high suspicion of adrenal cortical cancer on imaging study. Our uh, approach is that we also perform partial adrenalectomy in fibroanatomic location within the gland, in the case of small metastasis and in the case of adrenal cyst. In a period of 10 years, at our department, we performed laparoscopic partial adrenalectomy in 39 patients. Based on their characteristic, we divide them in three groups. Group 1 are patients with unilateral adrenal gland tumor with normal control adrenal gland. Group 2 patients with the tumors of the solitary adrenal gland. And group 3 the patients with adrenal cyst. So for the group 1, the patients with unilateral adrenal gland tumor with normal control adrenal gland the main characteristics of these 20 patients are favorable anatomical location with the gland, relatively small tumors with size of 2.5 cm. Median age of these patients was 50 years and median operative time was 70 minutes. When we look uh, 
of the pathology of this group of patients, we can see that majority of them are adenoma and pheochromocytoma. Then we have sporadic cases like metastasis of lung carcinoma, renal cell carcinoma, lymphoma, myelolipoma, lymphangioma. And to surprise, we even had one case of ACC with vice score 4. It was patient with a small tumor on the left side, solid 2 cm in diameter. And on MDT, we even discussed should we uh, follow this patient or perform operation. Then we selected this patient for operation and we performed partial, uh, partial adenolectomy. And uh, luckily, so far, this patient is without recurrence. We also look of uh, effect of partial adenolectomy on uh, hormone producing tumors. We had six cases of primary hyperdrosinism, four pheochromocytoma, and two Cushing syndrome. So all these patients had disease remission regarding to hormonal levels, so partial adrenalectomy is effective in the treatment of hormonally active tumors. In group 2, uh, the patients with tumor of the solitary adrenal gland, we had six patients, and all of these patients had metastasis of renal cell carcinoma in solitary adrenal gland. Uh, median size of the tumor was about 2 cm, and you can notice that a little bit longer operative time, about 100 minutes. The reason for that is because we, during the operation, really take care to resect completely uh, metastasis with wide margin to achieve adequate ecological control, which is the primary interest for this group of the patients. This group Median follow up time is 35 months. In the three patients, we preserve completely hormonal function of the remaining tissue of vaginal gland since, since these patients do not need any kind of replacement therapy. Uh, two patients died due to disease progression, but this disease progression was not related to metastasis in the adrenal gland. In group 3, uh, we perform partial adrenalectomy for adrenal cyst. Uh, this group includes 13 patients, and you can notice that this is the younger patient. Median age is 38 years, and the average diameter of this cyst are 10 centimeters. And uh, with partial approach, we never had recurrence in this group of the patient. When we look at the full data from all three groups, we don't have any conversion either to open or total laparoscopic adrenalectomy. For that, it is important very good preparatory in the imaging study and planning of the operation. We don't have uh, any major complication in early or late post-operative period, and the median hospital stay was three days. The dedication for partial adrenalectomy is well established in two cases. First patient with bilateral tumor, especially with familiar pheochromocytoma, and the patients with tumors of solitary adrenal gland. On that way, we try to preserve the function of adrenal to avoid the morbidity associated with chronic steroid substitution therapy. Partial adrenalectomy in patients with normal contralateral adrenal gland is still controversial, but when we compare this approach with kidney cancer, it should not be. First, Patients with solitary adrenal gland do not respond equally to stress as normal controls. Also, after total, uh, total adrenalectomy, especially young patients, there are many potential threats to the remaining adrenal gland during the lifespan, which could lead to adrenal insufficiency. The published study and our data shows that laparoscopic partial adrenalectomy is a safe and feasible procedure. So our proposal is to use partial adrenalectomy as a first line treatment for small adrenal mass. Osternismus. APA is very suitable for partial adrenalectomy since tumors are usually small. But we are not sure that detecting the adenoma really the source of excess aldosterone production. Also, it was shown that uh, multiple adenoma exist in the same gland in up to 10%, and also in the 10% of the cases can coexist co APA with adrenal hyperplasia. On the other hand, there are several publications which show that partial adrenalectomy is not inferior to total adrenalectomy in the treatment of APA. In our department, 
the golden standard for surgical APA treatment is still total adrenalectomy. It will be of the great interest uh, to develop real bulimagic study for detection of functional adenoma, use some kind of tracer during CT or MRI which will mark fu really functional adenoma inside of the adrenal gland. With such uh, study, the number of partial adrenalectomy will increase significantly. Total adrenalectomy prolongs survivors in the case of adrenal RCC metastasis. The data about uh, partial adrenalectomy in this approach are rare. Uh, we perform six cases of metachronous contralateral solitary adrenal RCC metastasis and in one case of metachronous ipsilateral adrenal RCC metastasis, we perform partial uh, adrenalectomy. With this approach, we try to achieve two goals. First, and what is the most important, it is uh, oncological control of uh, metastasis. The second one, we try to preserve the function of the remaining tissue of adrenal gland. Adrenalectomies are relatively uncommon and they are mostly benign. To perform total adrenalectomy for adrenalectomies could be considered over treatment since what we said they are mostly benign and they are often seen in younger group of the patients. In our group, median age was 38 years. On the other hand, marsupialization is connected with high percentage of recurrence, so partial adrenalectomy could be the method of the choice for the treatment of adrenalectomies. Literature is often mentioned that up to 7% of the adrenal cysts are potentially malignant. Based on our experience, I think these data are overrated. So later during the discussion, I would like to hear your experience and even uh, to join uh, the data from different groups to see what is the real incidence of malignancy in adrenal cyst. Is technically demanding procedure. Although on the right side, with the tumors located peripherally, it is even easier and faster to perform partial adrenalectomy than total adrenalectomy. I several times emphasize that location of the tumor within gland is important for planning and to perform partial adrenalectomy, so we could consider to develop some kind of adrenal scoring system like we have for kidney cancer renal scoring system. In our group of the patient, we always try to preserve the main adrenal vein, although there are published uh, some cases in which uh, adrenal vein was not preserved and the remaining uh, the tissue adrenal gland preserved hormonal function. Arthral supply from the free side favors partial resection and uh, to preserve uh, hormonal function of the remaining tissue it is important to save at least 30% of adrenal tissue. Uh, during the operation, it's very hard to estimate how much of the tissue is left, so it is again important good preoperative imaging and planning for partial resection. These are my temporary take home message. I hope that final take home message will get later after discussion. So first of all, it is important multidisciplinary approach. As I said, for plan and to perform partial adrenalectomy, it is important to have very good imaging study. And also we could think to develop uh, 3D imaging like we have for kidney tumors. Uh, to perform partial adrenalectomy, it is important that it is done in high volume center. Other study and published study and our study uh, shows that partial adrenalectomy is safe and effective procedure and we have to consider expanding indication for partial adrenalectomy. So now it is time for question discussion and what I would really like to discuss with you is your experience with the uh, incidence of malignancy in adrenal cyst. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, I can open. Uh, so the first question is, uh, what is my opinion regarding the functional imaging, uh, metamidat and uh, CXCR4 for diagnosing PA? 
so so far uh, the results that they have we have the results that the, the new functional imaging are also uh, non-inferior to adrenal vein sampling in subtyping uh, DPA. We do not have any experience in our country, so I cannot uh, say you regarding our cases, but uh, what I read through the studies so far is that this is non-inferior. So in the future, probably, maybe it will also replace AVS. We will see. There is no enough data so far uh, in comparison to AVS. The second question is yours. It's mine. As expected, I yeah. expected that more question will be about partial rectomy in uh, yeah. APA. But as I said during uh, my lecture, that uh, at our department, the start and treatment for APA is still total rectomy. Uh, among these six cases, what they presented, uh, four of them were patients younger than 35 years. These patients, we do uh, partial adrenalectomy, and two patients where we perform partial adrenalectomy for APA, it was done uh, because uh, uh, vein sampling was not so conclusive. Patients would like to have operations, so it, we did it in two cases, but luckily for these patients, so far they are good without biochemical recurrence. I, I agree with the second uh, question. Uh, you have to uh, read it. Yeah, okay. But do you think follow up is it long enough in partial direct studies in APA? I'm sure the outcome is the same. So, mm -hmm. as I told you, uh, because uh, there are the studies and they're usually short term studies, and I'm familiar with the group from uh, Nymingen about. Uh, risk of incomplete curing partial adrenalectomy, which shows that up to eight, 87% they have some micronodules inside uh, adrenal gland. So in literature so far it's about 10%. So I think that long outcome, if it is done in patient orders uh, today, then uh, uh, 35 years, I think that there is no B, uh, it will not show non-inferiority between partial and total adrenalectomy. So, but I hope that some kind of tracer in the future will see maybe really some patients we can do partial adrenalectomy, at least in 20% of cases or something like that. So I hope that in future we will have developed some really readable and useful imaging. Okay, that again question for me. Uh, so far, uh, there are no prospective studies uh, regarding the issue of partial adrenalectomy because uh, these, uh, uh, they are only uh, in men done, but th uh, this whole case is sporadic. So, and if you look, uh, there's as I know, and the, the number of the case in this study is really low. So, they are mostly, as I told you in the beginning, about partial adrenalectomy AP because uh, the incident is higher about uh, the use of partial directory in metastasis. I think that our data, what I know, maybe I don't know, is the biggest one. Uh, partial directory, and second, in your opinion, partial directory is also possible in the case of traumatic damage of adrenal gland. I think in that case, I think it could be done because we do it quite a lot of in uh, cyst which is quite big. And in the case of traumatic damage of the adrenal gland, I think it should be feasible, but I never tried to do something like that. Uh, mostly uh, I, because I have also experience with partial uh, nephrectomy. So I always try to transfer this knowledge with partial nephrectomy in the field of partial adrenalectomy, because if you, if you can do that with malignant disease and majority of uh, Admiral uh, tumors are benign, then I think that we can repeat something like that. Okay. And uh, I agree that adrenal cysts are benign, especially with current excellent imaging possibilities. We don't miss the ACC. But if you look to the lit literature, there is always the date that up to six, seven percent of them are malignant. So. I think that we could join the data and make nowadays nowadays imaging that it is not case that uh, asthma cysts are up to 
uh, percent malignant because it is really overrated and really to think about because in our, our group as you see the average age is 38 years it is young patients so why to do a total directomy because it could be over treatment because these young patients they have 50 to 60 years to live with solitary gland or even to do marsupialization uh, where there is high rate of recurrence. So I really would like later from different group to join the data. I think uh, we showed the data just for 10 years, but I think we have about 23 or no, about 40 cases of other cysts, they're all benign. And if you look the published uh, series about other cysts, these numbers are already significant. But if you have from different group data about other cysts, we can uh, uh, joint this data showed nowadays that this um, estimate about about up to 7% of malignity is uh, too much. If you want, I can answer the, the next one. Uh, okay. What are the medications that we give prior the adrenalectomy total or partial for PA to avoid uh, complications like in FIO? So uh, we do not give uh, any medication special one before the adrenalectomy because uh, we do not expect some uh, uh, intraoperative complications. Uh, there is no problem with patients with primary ALDO. They are not going to be in a hypertensive crisis or something like that. This is, this is um, not in that case happening. If you want to comment something else, you can. No, for AP, uh... Because uh, we do everything in MDT and uh, the day before operation, uh, our uh, patients are uh, at the uh, Department of Endocrinology and on the day of operation, they move to our department. So this all preoperative uh, medication is done by endocrinologists for, at our department, they're just for operation. And shortly after that, they're released home. But for the anesthesiologist, this is a routine uh, uh, su surgery, is it? For the anesthesiologist, there are no complications. For, the... for APA, there is no complication. They take a little bit of care about the hypokalemia before and after surgery because it is important because of hypokalemia, the effect of anesthesia, a postoperative, some cardiac problems or something like that, because it is only the question of uh, potassium. So, but it is not like pheochromocytoma. Thank you guys so much. Um, those were the questions that came in through during the presentations. If there are not any more questions, I would like to end the webinar by, first of all, thank you to everyone that joined our webinar this evening. A big thank you to the presenters for the interesting presentations. The webinar has been recorded and will be available on both our GoToWebinar platform and YouTube channel. I shall send the links tomorrow. Um, and all the links for our previous sessions are on our website. Um, and so are the details for forthcoming webinars. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, and finally, all of you who have attended today will receive a survey immediately after the session has finished. We would like to um, ask you if you could fill that out so uh, we can continue to improve our further sessions. Thank you so much for everyone and especially Nicola and Karen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening. To Thank everybody. you very much. Bye. Bye.